We are coming to Vermont at an unprecedented time in history where our children are in significant trouble. More than six million children under the age of six in this country live in poverty. More than three million children under the age of six do not have health insurance. More than two million two-year-olds are not fully immunized. And nearly one million babies are born every year in this country without adequate prenatal care. More than a million children under five are in inadequate childcare settings. More than 85,000 babies every year are physically abused. Yet we, as governors, have had to spend a great deal of whatever discretionary funds we have on building prisons, on putting children in foster care, instead of investing in programs and services that can reduce these statistics. We have had a remarkable opportunity this year, and we will have into the coming years, to radically restructure the federal-state relationship and improve the way that government supports individuals and families. This year, we have had a remarkable opportunity to see local projects, often started by people in communities without support, succeed in their communities in doing things for children that are supportive and in helping their parents become better parents, the kind of parents uh, that we need in America to make our country strong again and to reverse the trends that I've just outlined. During the course of the next three days, we'll hear from a variety of speakers who will share their thoughts about the role of business in promoting change and supporting children, about the federal budget and block grants, and about reshaping federal and state relationships, about how to change the way government responds to the needs of young children and families. The first of our speakers today is an individual who is an important leader in the American business community but is invited here because he's had 25 years of experience working on education issues. He, in some ways, has two careers. The first is as CEO of a number of extraordinarily successful companies, but the second is, an ad, 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 is that of an advocate for education and for children. He and his company have supported Vermont's efforts to reinvent our schools with a $2 million grant there are four other $2 million grants that IBM has announced around uh, the country, or will announce, to support excellence in schools and to try to change and turn these school systems around. Our special guest is Louis Gerstner, chairman and CEO of the IBM Corporation, one of the largest industrial companies in the United States. I'm extremely proud to welcome Mr. Gerstner back to Vermont and we look forward to your remarks. Thank you, Governor Dean. It's good to be back in Vermont. In 1983, the report, A Nation at Risk, focused the country's attention on the deficiencies in our public school system. Here's a quote from that report that has stuck with me for many years. Quote, if an unfriendly foreign power had imposed our schools upon us, we would have regarded it as an act of war. Unquote. That was 12 years ago. What's happened since? Lots of hand-wringing, lots of speeches, lots of reports, not much change, very little improvement. It's 12 years since A Nation at Risk was published, and US students still finish at or at near the bottom of international tests of math and science. I wonder what the national reaction would have been if in the 1984 Olympics Games we had finished dead last. A national outrage in all likelihood that would have brought about sweeping changes 
in amateur athletics in this country. Believe me, now, 11 years later, we would have seen massive improvements. But in public education, none. And no national outrage or frustration 12 years after a nation at risk. Let's move from 1983 to the Education Summit in 1989, when at a meeting similar to this, President Bush and the nation's governors set the wheels in motion for the Educate America Act, Goals 2000, that President Clinton helped shape and then signed in June of 1994. Let me read just a few of those goals that we set for ourselves by the year 2000. All children in America will start school ready to learn. The high school graduation rate will increase to at least 90%. All students will leave grades 4, 8, and 12 having demonstrated competency in English, math, science, foreign language, civics and governments, economics, art, history, and geography. Every school in America will ensure that all students learn to use their minds well so they may be prepared for responsible citizenship, further learning, and productive employment in our nation's modern economy. Six years have passed since those wonderful goals were set. More importantly, 1,616 days remain till the year 2000 arrives. I wonder how many people in our country are committed to achieving those goals. I wonder how many people think we have a chance of achieving them. I often think how many people even know they exist. One of the goals I just cited talks about graduation rates and another the need for standards. I read recently that Milwaukee now has a requirement that high school seniors must demonstrate a proficiency in math before they are allowed to graduate. That is great. And we need more cities and states doing the same. But the same article I read reported that 79% of the junior class failed in a warm-up test this spring. That's dismal and reflective of our country at large. Now, that's not the whole story. The test consists of complex, open-ended problems, which for these kids was a new approach to math exactly the right approach, of course, exactly the direction we want to head in, and they'll have a full year to master it. But what happens then? What happens next year if a large percentage of the senior class fails to demonstrate the required proficiency? Will Milwaukee refuse to graduate those who fail? If they don't, so much for standards. But it's not that easy. What do we do about the students we've promoted for 13 years through the public school system without demanding high performance? How will they get the skills necessary to earn a living? And of course, it's much worse than a single class of seniors. We have given high school diplomas in this country to a whole generation of Americans who cannot basically read those diplomas. They are functionally illiterate. The bottom line is that if our kids are failing in the classroom, it's not just their fault, it's our fault. And that, my friends, underscores a very frightening reality. Setting goals for U.S. education is one thing. Reaching them is another. 
And the only way it will happen, the only way that we have a ghost of a chance of getting there, is if we push through a fundamental, bone-jarring, full-fledged, 100% revolution that discards the old and replaces it with a totally new performance-driven system, which is what brings me to Vermont today. I'm here because of Willie Sutton. Willie robbed banks, the story goes, because he realized that's where the money is. I'm here because this is where the power is. The power to reform, no, no, not reform, to revolutionize the U.S. public school system. You are the CEOs of the organizations that fund and oversee the country's public schools. That means you are responsible for their health. They are very, very sick at the moment. And we are past the time for incremental change and tinkering at the margin. Fortunately, we're not past the point of no return. I've spent a lot of time on education. So have many of you. We all have scars to prove it. But I've also spent a lot of time helping troubled companies get back on their feet. It's hard work, lots of hard work, and it invariably involves massive structural change. But here's the good news. When companies do turn around, they often go on to bigger and better things. I'm convinced that our public schools can do that. We can win gold medals in the Education Olympics, but it will take a world-class effort, and it will only happen if you, the CEOs of the system, reach out, grab it by the throat, shake it up, and insist that it happen. The turnarounds we've seen in corporate America don't come close to the complexities of the job you face in fixing our public schools. But I believe the principles of structural revolution are the same. First, it takes a personal commitment on the part of the CEO. This is not a job you can delegate. Two, it takes a willingness to confront and expel the people and the organizations that are throwing up roadblocks to the changes you consider critical. Three, you need to set high expectations. You can't have too many goals. One or two are best, certainly no more than three. It's critical to measure the progress against those goals relentlessly and continuously. And finally, there must be a willingness on the part of the change agent to hold people accountable for results. Nothing pleases me more than to see some of you moving in this direction in your states. You are responsible for some very, very bright spots in an overall dismal picture. But there aren't nearly enough. So what do we do now? In the spirit of my views on how one goes about radical restructuring of an institution, I want to suggest three and only three priorities for public education for the next year. The first is setting absolutely the highest academic standards and holding all of us accountable for results now immediately next year, this school year. Now, if we don't do that, we don't need any more goals because we're going nowhere. Without standards and accountability, we have nothing. But if we do have standards and accountability, I would suggest two other priorities that are critical to allow our institutions of education to reach those goals and they are funding change and exploiting technology. Let's talk very briefly about each. First, standards 
and accountability. If we don't face up to the fact that we are the only major country in the world without an articulated set of education standards and without a means of measuring how successful we are in reaching them, we're lost before we get started, which pretty much sums up where we are today. To turn the tide, we must set standards immediately, and we must have a means of measuring how we're doing. Without standards, education reform is shuffling deck chairs on the Titanic. You know, I have to confess, I find the whole thing baffling to me, baffling. In virtually everything else we do in the United States, we set high standards and strive to be number one. Why not in education? In basketball, you score when the ball goes in the hoop, not if it hits the rim. In football, you score when you cross the goal line, not when you show up in uniform. In track and field, you must jump over the bar, not go under it or around it. And who would practice baseball with the fences at 150 feet from home plate? Why can't we establish standards of excellence for our schools? Why isn't winning in the classroom important in America? We put a man in space because we set a goal that was beyond, not within our grasp. We need the same approach for education. And we must be relentless in its pursuit. The lessons we understand so well in every other aspect of our lives must be translated into education or else we will lose. We cannot be sidetracked by academicians who say it will take five years just to set the standards. Nor can we be misled by misinformed people who will argue that certain Americans aren't able to reach high standards, so it's inappropriate to even set them. I find that insulting and demeaning to those people, not supportive. It boils down to the fact that we just can't settle anymore for mediocrity. We must commit to the highest levels of student achievement, and we must do it now. We can't allow our schools to simply sit back, complacently convinced that their only responsibility is to keep students at their desk until they're 18 years old. They'll get to 18 fast enough, regardless of what we do. What they need from us are tools to help prepare them for success as they go off to college or work, raise families, and join the adult community. This requires an articulated set of academic standards that recognizes the real world they'll be entering. In many places, they don't even exist at a rudimentary level. Many states still require only two years of math and science for a high school diploma. Why? Math isn't something that students can finish in the 10th grade and think they'll never need it again. And if we're going to do it right, we must make sure our high school students take real math, academic math, not what the students call dummy math. And they must take laboratory science, not general science. We must find innovative, innovative ways to help students master these complex subjects. And we must hold schools accountable for what students learn. It's not enough to m memorize facts and figures. Whether we're dealing with the requirements of the job market or skills needed to participate in society, the bar is higher and gets higher every year. When the Labor Department recently asked businesses what they expect of schools to teach, the answer was clear, a foundation of reading, writing, arithmetic, combined with an ability to use information to solve problems and to communicate effectively. Those are not esoteric or complex concepts. 
They are, however, for every one of these children, the difference between success or failure in their lives. We must find ways to teach them, to measure whether they've been taught, and to reward teachers and administrators at schools where students succeed. And we must have serious sanctions for those at schools where students are not learning. Obviously, Milwaukee will have a difficult choice to make next year because it's out in front. But the fact remains that until we are prepared to penalize students, teachers, and administrators for lack of performance, the system will fail. Let me please repeat that. Until we are prepared to penalize students, teachers, and administrators for lack of performance, the system will fail. We have a word for that in business, accountability. It works. Without it, institutions atrophy and die. Let's turn quickly to the second and third priorities beyond standards. True accountability performance, true accountability for performance will depend on exploiting technology and financing change in the system. You've all heard about information technology. Bear with me if this sounds a bit stuffy, but information technology is the fundamental underpinning of the science of structural reformation. It is the force that revolutionizes business, streamlines government, and enables instant communication and the exchange of information among peoples and institutions around the world. But information technology has not, however, made even its barest appearance in most public schools. Look around. The most visible forms of technology remain the unintelligible public address systems, which serve largely to interrupt the business of learning, and the copier in the principal's office, which spews out the forms and regulations that are the lifeblood of the education bureaucracy. Before we can get the education revolution rolling, we need to recognize that our public schools are low-tech institutions in a high-tech society. And the same changes that brought about cataclysmic change to every facet of business can improve the way we teach students and teachers. And it also can improve the efficiency and effectiveness of how we run our schools. I'd like to make you all a personal offer I'd like to invite you, the governors, and your key people to a conference that I will organize, pay for, and run next year. I'll get experts from all parts of our industry, including our competitors, to participate, and together we will show you how technology created for business and government can be used to help reshape the schools of America. We'll put it all together but we'll need your help, and you'll have to be there. You'll have to invest a day, not a few hours, because as I said before, real change requires the participation of the CEO. It'll be worth it. I think you'll be excited by the innovative things that are beginning to happen in some classrooms. And some of you are already doing some very interesting things with technology in education. Let's think about how technology is benefiting kids right here in Vermont. For example, the portfolios used to measure student development are being taken out of manila folders and put on a digital disks. This allows educators to make evaluations based on a student's entire output rather than on Simple multiple choice questions. Chicago is combining the power of telecommunications and the internet to train teachers in math and science. Schools in Charlotte, North Carolina are using video technology to reach into the home. Philadelphia schools are using voice technology to teach language skills to learning impaired children. And outside the classroom, technology is cutting away at the school bureaucracy 
and dealing with routine matters like bus routing, meal deliveries, and purchasing. Which brings me to my third priority, financing change. It is my experience in business, and especially in turnaround situations, that if you want to bring about real change, Budget allocations must support the new directions. Reforms perish from lack of support, and that means resources. True change agents put their money where their mouth is. The educational Bolsheviks fight hard to starve the reformers. So how do we finance the revolution? How do we use our educational resources to reward success and encourage performance? Let's start with the $150 billion or so that you as the CEOs of our states invest directly in the public school system. That's about half of the $300 billion that is spent by state and localities. 150 from the states. I've done some homework, so I know that a state's education budget is typically constructed by adding a percentage increase to the prior year's outlays, and the basic formula, which is clearly described as arcane, is largely driven by the number of pupils in the system, and it supports priorities that have been around for decades and rarely, if ever, is linked to performance, success, or change. Here's my proposal. Let's try something new. This year, instead of following the old formula, hold back 10 cents of every dollar and earmark it for strategic investment. That's 5 cents out of every dollar in total spent in your state, 10 cents out of every dollar that comes from the state itself. Now, where would we put this $15 billion to work? If it were me, I'd invest a portion of it into moving teacher training out of the horse and buggy era. We expect doctors to get their training in teachers' hospitals, and we wouldn't send an NBA player on the court if his only training consisted of lectures on the theory of the jump shot case studies of the fast break, and films of games played years ago. Why then do we entrust our children to teachers who have only listened to lectures, written essays on classroom management, and read textbooks on the theory of child development? It's time teachers learn their craft in real schools, side by side with expert teachers. It's time they got the kinds of hands-on experience most other professionals consider vital for certification. If it were up to me, I'd invest some of the $15 billion to reorganize how our kids spend their time in school. In Japan, where the school year runs 240 days a year, the average 18-year-old has spent more cumulative time in school than the average American MBA. And while I challenge you to find a teacher anywhere in this country who truly believes that every subject, or any subject for that matter, is best taught in exactly 45 minutes. We still ring the bell at the end of each period as though there was a natural order to it all. A science project might take it's a full six hours to complete. Other subjects may be best taught in 15-minute slots over a two-week period. The school, day, week, and year needs to be reshaped fundamentally to reflect reality. There are hundreds of good ideas out there about how to use the 15 billion. I know about them. You know about them. Some of the most promising are emerging from the New American Schools Development Corporation, which is funding development or breakthrough reforms across the country. All that's lacking 
is the courage to shift funding from the status quo that has failed unarguably to the agenda of reform and hope for our children. Obviously, my three suggestions are sure to generate howls of protest from the education establishment and from others who are happy with the status quo and unwilling to change. They will say that setting standards is not possible in education or that setting high standards will only raise the dropout rate. Others will attack the focus on technology, maintaining it's a self-serving business scam or a vain grasp for a silver bullet that won't work. Still others will attack the 15 billion for reallocating, the 15 billion that we reallocated for strategic investment, saying it's just a gimmick, it won't work, and it's really in disguise an approach to cut education budgets. I see it as just the opposite. Most everyone in the education community talks reform and supports reform, but when push comes to shove, they back off and attribute the lack of progress to the lack of financial wherewithal. Well, now we have it. Our $15 billion fund will provide a way to kickstart a major effort for reform. And here's the real kicker. We're only going to give the $15 billion to the schools and systems that actually implement true reform. Let me conclude by recognizing again that many of you are working very hard to bring about the changes that we need. The problem is not enough of us in America are committed to seeing that change happens. Too many of us just talk about it. You are the leaders of our 50 states. It really is up to you to bring us the educational leadership we desperately need. School reform is not a partisan issue. So I would hope that you would work together as a team and that you would support and learn from each other. We're talking about the future of our nation. Economic prosperity for all our citizens is an empty and cynical dream unless we provide the necessary education to all students. Perhaps more ominously, no democracy can survive without an educated citizenry. So let's add an R to our traditional reading, writing, and arithmetic, an R for revolution. The country needs a new revolution. The first one gave birth to America. We now need a second to save our country and to give our children back their future. Thank you very much. agreed to take uh, just a couple of questions. Any questions and comments? Governor Hunt. Mr. Gerstner, you may not realize the significance of that uh, applause you just received. Not many people get that much here. Thank you. Especially unless they're I'm, running I'm, for president, and even some of them don't. First of all, I want to I wanna congratulate you on IBM's comeback. It is truly a great thing in this country's economy and you deserve 
the great part of the credit for leading that as the CEO. And I, a lot of us have uh, IBM facilities in our states. Vermont has uh, some they're very proud of. Uh, we in North Carolina have about 13,000 jobs or more and a billion dollars in payroll. We appreciate it, and I want to thank you personally. Second, uh, you've been on the front line of uh, American business in focusing on education and reform for quite a while. I don't know how many of you uh, governors have this. John Engler has got his copy, uh, I see. But it's a terrific book that uh, Lou did uh, several years ago. And, uh, and I thank you, because I, I really believe that the progress we're making, and we are making some progress that hasn't shown up yet in, as dramatically as it ought to in scores. But, but, but what we've done over the last several years has been because business leaders have been there with governors and some other leaders in bringing about change. And I would urge you to, to stay there and continue to help us. Uh, you, you said, I think, correctly that we as the CEOs of the states have got to lead this effort. And you couldn't say anything more true. It is not going to happen, my fellow governors, unless we lead it. The state chief school officer, by him or herself, can't do that. The school board can't. The legislative committees can't do it. We've all got to work as a team, but the governors really have to lead it. By the way, I accept right now to come to your conference next year, and I suspect a lot of us will be there. I wanted to get to two other things. First, uh, uh, you, you talked about the goals, and we've got to set them. The governors did uh, make a big step toward that uh, several years ago when they came together with President George Bush and established goals. And a panel has been established made up of state leaders, primarily state leaders, some congressional involvement, to work toward that. Is that a, an endeavor you think we ought to stay true to and continue to work on? Well, Governor, uh, I, I would, first of all, thank you for your very nice comments. Those were, uh, we're very proud to be part of North Carolina's economy. Uh, I think my remarks indicated that you cannot argue with the six goals that were established with President Bush that wound up being eight goals when uh, the Clinton administration endorsed and the act went through. They're all good goals. Um, but you know, when you, when you gotta, when you gotta change something, you gotta measure results every day. And in a funny way, establishing goals gives institutions somehow uh, walking around room to feel like, well, we got goals, so we're, we're okay. We're okay. 400,000 young people drop out of school every year in this country. 400,000 of the most precious assets in our country. How can we wait? Why is it six years later and an article appeared in the paper this week that said, it looks like we're getting around to starting to set the standards? Six times 400,000 is 2.4 million Americans we've doomed to a life of pain and poverty. Governor, there's nothing wrong with those goals. But who's living them every day? Where is the measurement of success? No goals are worth a damn if you don't measure progress against them on a regular basis. Well, and so my view is, I love the goals. What did we do yesterday? What are we going to do tomorrow? What's our plan for next week? And so, yeah, they're great. But I think perhaps by setting goals that spoke about the year 2000, as opposed to goals that speak about next year's school system, uh, maybe we left ourselves a little bit of air cover that was too high. And we went on to other things. Let me add that the National Education Goals Panel, that again, that, that governors give very strong leadership on a bipartisan way to, uh, yesterday moved to, to set standards, working together, 
uh, to develop assessments that are real world, that are authentic, that will help see if people are ready to hold your jobs and others, and to work with the states to help all of them do this job of setting standards, developing good assessments, and really biting the bullet, so to speak. Now, that's a job we're going to need to have business help us with, because that is tough. And, 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 and I would just urge that, that American business help us with the National Education Goals Panel. If that's, if that's something we ought to continue, and I hope we as governors would want to continue to work on that. But uh, we thank you for what you've done. Thank we you, are Governor. getting the tough yeah. stuff, and that's when we need business to stand up and say to legislatures and to people all over our state, hey, we do have to do these standards. We have got to assess in different ways other than just true, false, multiple choice. Can you do the stuff? That's, that's what we're going to really need your help on, and I, I know you're there. I just hope American business leadership well, America, will continue to American help business is not there. American business uh, gives about $300 million a year to K through 12 education. And you know where it goes? It goes to support the status quo. It goes to adopt a school. It goes to send a few computers. I mean, sending computers is a good thing to do. Uh, <laughs> but it, uh, you know, uh, buy some books. I mean, it, it, is, it, is, it is the American business community has been blind to this problem because it has been going through fundamentally a downsizing period and now we're coming out of that and we're going out to hire people and we find out they can't even read or write and we have to educate them in ways that we're not prepared or constructed to do. Uh, so the American business community has got to get to be a force for revolution too. I agree with you. Uh, let me say this to you. Uh, we have a leadership role, and you have a leadership role, and the business community has. Uh, we have a strong advocacy group out there among the education establishment that don't want to see change. It's the only area that doesn't get it yet. Uh, in our state, as you're familiar with, we put our GEM Council, the Governor's Education Management Council, and got to Joe Gorman and John Ung and John Pepper, and they sat there, and we empowered the private sector to get involved in education reform. A lot of what we got done could never have been got done unless those business people actually were there and took a leadership role. If I go through Ohio and I look at the school districts that are making measurable improvement, the business community is involved in curriculum, they're involved in helping improve efficiency in the operations of those schools, and uh, I just want you to know that the business community is going to have to take a much larger role in this effort if we're to beat down the people who are supportive of status quo. Now, we're going to, we got a bill in Congress today called the Education and Training. And there's a big battle about how that money, school to work, how that money's going to be distributed. The educators are in there and they're lobbying the hell out of Congress on it. I think the business community ought to get in there and say, we pay taxes, we're not getting the return that we ought to be getting from the school system. We ought to have more to say about how this money is going to be spent and take care of your customers. But unless that happens, you're not going to get the people you want. You're going to have to retrain people, add it to your overhead, and ultimately, you aren't going to be able to compete in the world marketplace. Now, we're willing to help you, but we need your clout. We've got to let those schools know that what happens there is important to the businesses in their community and the future of this country. So it's a partnership. I agree. I accept. I accept. And I also want to say to you, Governor, that the $400 million that uh, your state is earmarked for technology in K through 4 is one of the great things I've heard about in a while. I think it's terrific, and I wish you very uh, good success with it. I hate to cut this off, but we have uh, Senator Domenici who's been very patient. I want to again thank Lou Gerstner. I have not heard uh, a, an exposition of America, about American education, which is as challenging. And I just want uh, Governor Hunt to know that he is only the second governor to sign up for that technology concert, conference because I passed Doug Gross, our manager here in Essex Junction, a note just before you spoke, Governor, that said I accept and I want to be on that uh, <laughs> IBM technology in the schools conference. But we thank you very much.